Hi, my name is Barbara Chamberlain, and this is an abbreviated version of a presentation I gave at the Duster Magic Institute in November 2010. Duster Magic is a great two-and-a-half-day event put on by Warren Buckleitner and the folks at Children's Technology Review. A really great immersion of presentations and demonstrations and critical review of how we can use technology and games and media to really change the lives of children as well as their learning. This is me. I'm the one in the middle and a couple of the motivations for the work that I do. In fact, when my oldest son was having problems learning how to write his letters in preschool, my husband and I were trying to figure out how best to help him. And we knew the problem he had was not following dotted lines. He could trace dotted lines. It was that he was not understanding and internalizing where you start the stroke length for each letter, a very common problem. And we knew what he needed was not more of the same. That's one of the critical errors we see in children's games and interactive technology is they enable learners to learn and to do and to practice in the exact same way they learn and do and practice on paper or in a lecture or classroom format. That's sort of a waste of technology. Technology and games should enable learning that is different kind of practice. And that's what we did. We created an app for that. We created the application for the iPhone Letter Writer Oceans. You'll notice it's just capital letters and there's, uh, it's not necessarily tracing of dotted lines, but once you select a letter, you start at the fish and you follow the bubble. So with H, you start at the top, you can drag it along, and if you do this four times, you unlock a poem that's read to you. In this case, H is for hammerhead shark, and there's all sorts of different letters in there. Following that up, you went to first grade and went into lowercase letters because, you know, we learn our uppercase and our lowercase letters at different times. So we created letter writer space for that as well. Now, when we are not creating software just for our own children's purposes, I work at the Learning Games Lab at New Mexico State University. We have been in game development for 20 years. Our first work was touchscreen kiosks for museums. We just saw smoking in a pack. That was tobacco prevention for young kids. First CD came around 97, which is crazy about corn for kindergarten for third graders. Fast forward 20 years, and we've created games for a variety of audiences, adults, kids, variety of content from K-12 learning to on-the-job training. Some of our current projects that we're working on, Science Pirates we released last year. That's an online game, a pirate adventure. It takes about two hours to play, and it aligns with national science standards for process and for experiment design. We're currently working on Math Snacks. Math Snacks emphasizes concepts behind the questions that kids get wrong in math. It all goes down to third grade and concepts that kids never really understood and that starts that lack of understanding starts manifesting itself in sixth grade. So Math Snacks is a series of animations and games all available free online at mathsnacks.com. We're also currently working on Ninja Kitchen. This is, you'll see some, some uh, placeholder art in this because this is in uh, production right now. It's a diner dash game, a cooking game, where the player not only has to do time management of cooking, but they learn all the proper food safety procedures as well. When they wash their hands and cooking to the proper temperature, kids start learning how to cook in mid-school and developing their habits, and we're trying to use game play to change those habits for them. We also do research on games. We're currently on a USDA obesity prevention grant where we're created the website Extra Games Unlocked. It shares research on extra games or active games and really it also gives day-to-day real-life tips on how to use them and select the games as well as some of the surprising research and findings we've had with our work in schools and in other uses of extra games as well. So all of this really for us has led to the question of trying to make games that don't stink. Now, there's a lot of us that are trying to do this, and of course there's a lot that goes into that. You have to have talent, and you have to have funding for the games, and a vision, and, and we've been very lucky with, with many of those things. But I think there's significantly two things that drive our process at New Mexico State University. The first is an instructional design process where we really work collaboratively with content experts as well as our developers. They work con collaboratively throughout the whole process together. And that really helps because everybody on the team is driven by the learning goals. But the second thing that really defines our process is user testing. And this is something we've been playing with very intensely the past six or seven years. And that's what I want to share in this presentation is some of the strategies that have evolved as we've been refining our techniques. When it comes down to 
everything that we do, it's defined by user testing. And I know a lot of us do user testing for different reasons. In our history of video and game and web development, we do user testing, but it, it's been hard. We're at a university and we have to have consent forms and approval and you only get the kids for a short period of time. So you do focus testing and you then you remember something the day after and you don't have them anymore. And it we did it, but it wasn't facilitated as, as much as we would like. It wasn't as easy as it could have been. So we took a space and designed it specifically for getting feedback and we called that the learning games lab in our learning games lab we have a laptop bank of computers as well as mobile devices we have all the consoles and games and then we bring kids in this is what's unique about it over the summer we have them in for a series of two-week sessions in a think tank and in our think tank our game consultants we don't call them kids we don't call them subjects we don't call them testies they are our game consultants they spend two weeks half days with us and we go through a whole protocol with them where they are training and they learn things about games and then we can test with them whenever we need to. We also then bring experts in during the school year. So throughout the summer, almost every day in the summer, we have access to members of our target audience and throughout the school year, we don't go more than a month without having access. And what that does is it gives us the ability at any minute when we hit a design question and we say, huh, are these graphics too juvenile? Let's run them to the kids and find out. Is this level too difficult or is it on par with what they're learning? Let's run it to the kids and find out. Out. So what this has done for us is given us a very well-prepared audience that helps us test and advises us as part of our testing. And it's dramatically increased how much testing we do because, quite frankly, it just is so easy. At the heart of all of our using testing, what we all really want to know is, do you like it, right? That's the question we most want to ask. Now, of course, it's not just that because we want to know why and why not and how could we improve it? Is it too juvenile? Can you figure out how to work it? Is it too hard? Are you learning what you're supposed to? But the funny thing is, though these are the questions we want to know, I found in our user testing, we can't ask them. We can't just come out and ask these questions because even though do you like it is at the heart of it, generally speaking, people are not very good at saying why they like something. Now this is counterintuitive. We think this isn't true because people tell us, oh, I'll tell you what I like about it. But it doesn't quite work that way, especially kids. Kids are so forthright, we think, oh, well, they'll just be very blunt about what they like about it. But I would have to say, generally speaking, people, including kids, are not very good at saying why they like something, and here's why. When you are able to tell me why you like something, several different things have to happen. First, <clears throat> You have to know you like it. Now, that seems kind of obvious, but uh, I don't know. If I asked you if you like something, do you like it today? Are you just in a really good mood and you like everything? Do you like it or do you just not dislike it? Do you like it more than something else or does it seem fine to you and you don't really care? That's really a very complex question. And even if you're able to understand that you do like it, you have to know why. And that is even more complex. You have to know why you like something, even when you may not fully understand it. You might see a character that is, for example, um, out of weight and they're unattract or overweight, and they're unattractive to you, and you don't like them. But you may not even want to admit to yourself or be cognizant yourself that that is the reason that you don't like the way that character is drawn. We aren't always very good at identifying the motivations for our own understandings of things. And if you can do that, you have to move beyond simply noticing. Noticing is what we're good at. If I ask you if you like my outfit and you would say, well, yes, of course I do. And I say, why? And you kind of go through all these thoughts in your mind. Why do I like it? Does it flatter you? Is it a good color on you? Do I just like it better than what the other person is wearing? Is it better than what you were wearing earlier today? And because you're waiting for an answer, I just quickly grab the first thing I notice and I say, because it's a great color. It doesn't necessarily mean that's why I like it. It's just what I notice. And this is why when you ask kids about games, they always first comment on the graphics. That's what's most noticeable. But as you work more and more with users of games, the graphics are not as important as we think they are. If you have engaging graphics or engaging gameplay, bad graphics are totally <laughs> forgivable. So uh, for you to tell me why you like something, you have to be able to not only know you like it, know why, you have to get beyond just simply noticing and really understand the reasoning behind it.
Then you have to overcome all the influences. You might like me and you want to please me. Or there's somebody else in the focus group and you want to say the same thing as them and become part of the group. Or maybe you want to take your role very seriously as a critic and provide criticism. Or maybe uh, you you just saw a movie last weekend. We uh, did some testing with the kids for our what's now Ninja Kitchen because we were going to play it with pirates. And the kids told us that pirates were so last year. So we were trying to figure out new trends. And I was sick that day and I, I what's the new trends we're looking for? And the team said they were suggesting either ninjas or Vikings. And I thought, Vikings? That's kind of a new trend. And I realized how to train your dragon. The, the very clever Viking movie had just come out that previous weekend. So I think the kids had just seen that movie and they were like, Vikings, yeah! I wasn't ready to call it a trend yet. So we waited a few months, asked the kids again. Vikings didn't even show up on the radar, so we went with ninjas. So even if you can do these things and you can recognize those influences in the room, you have to communicate clearly. You have to be comfortable with writing or speaking or speaking in front of other people or putting these things in the sentences. And that can be very difficult for even the most comfortable people in situations. And then, of course, I have to understand you free of all of my biases. Now, does this mean we should never ask these questions? We should just give up? Do we think that children or adults are not good for tech? Absolutely not. It just means for us to get the answers to these questions, we have to be a little more clever about it and work it in different ways. Here's what's worked for us. First off, Make sure you're asking the right questions. Now, uh, let me just start off with the obvious. You know you're not supposed to ask yes or no questions. I know you're not supposed to ask yes or no questions. But of course, we all ask yes or no questions because it is just part of our human nature to ask yes or no questions. The problem with asking a yes or no question is you don't realize it's a yes or no question until you get to the end of the question. And so you'll say, so tell me, do you like this game? Oh, shoot, I just asked you another question. Let me let me phrase that another way. Uh, uh, are the characters something you think are appealing? Oh, shoot, that's a yes or no question. So one of the strategies I have, right on the top of my clipboard, I write the words do and is, and I put a strike out. If you can catch your yes or no question at the beginning and not start them with do or is, you'll have half of the battle run right there. Instead, on my clipboard, I write the words tell me and how. If you can rephrase your questions with tell me and how, you right there have won part of that yes-no battle that you have. The second, and again this is obvious, but it's so helpful, is to write your questions down. This has two purposes. First, of course, it's nice to come back to your list of questions, but it also is important because when you have a clipboard with questions, it inserts important pauses where you're talking to kids and you nod your head and they say something. You say, okay, well, let me just take a look at my list. And as you kind of thumb through those questions, it has forced pauses where kids then can kind of feel relaxed enough to bring up another issue. Let me look through these questions. Is there anything else you wanted to tell me about that while I'm looking at my questions? It's amazing how much that pause while you are engaged in something will prompt kids to do more talking. Secondly, we try to treat our subjects as advisors and not subjects. The difference with that is I'm not asking you as a subject what you think. I'm asking you to tell me what other people that you know think. So instead of saying what age are you and do you like it, I say what age do you think this game is for? Or think of your friends. Who will like this? What kind of games do they play? How would they feel about it? Which of your friends would you recommend this for? What kinds of games do kids in your class like? That helps our game consultants really take that role of advisor on and be much more uh, thoughtful and reflective in how they respond. Certainly we use multiple ways of asking questions and getting feedback. This has two parts. Certainly you want to ask questions in lots of different ways, not because our, our users are stupid and can't answer a question, but because you're going to ask a question and they're going to think about it and then they're going to think about it and they'll have some kind of new idea on it. And if you ask the question a little bit differently later, they will have the benefit of reflecting on it the first time and have new information to give you. But multiple ways of getting feedback, that is the biggie for us. You see here we just did an observe where first we just observe them using our, our, uh, num our, uh, our um, monster school bus game that we're testing now. We observe them, we're taking notes while they're doing and then we ask them some questions about it. But that's not all that we do. We also then take them into our video closet. This has been the biggest brainstorm I think that I've had in this user testing. The video closet is just a space set aside. It has a camera on a wall, a whiteboard where we can write questions. What happens is the user goes in, reads the question, can sit, 
think, reflect on it. And when he or she is ready, turn the camera on and talk. This has been amazing in controlling groupthink and helping kids that are maybe a little reticent in group, group discussions to really think and reflect. For kids who really like to think and reflect before they talk, it's just been a fantastic way to get thick and rich feedback. And we got it all recorded at the same time. We also have a blogging area. We had kids writing down, and it was like it was the worst thing ever, asking them to write with a pencil. So we, we kind of set up our blogging area with taller, like, bar stools, and they go onto a blog, and they have to write out their questions. This is not the favorite of all of our kids, but some of them really prefer writing, and we also think it's important to build their own literacies in writing and doing feedback. Every day when we have kids in our game lab, whether it's a question I want to know about or not, every day they practice blogging, they practice video clauses so that they get that experience and that proficiency in expressing their ideas, even if it's just asking them to blog or write about a commercially prepared game. Another technique we use is creative development. Lots of us in this industry have kids creating things. That's not anything new. We also use creative development as a way of getting feedback. So for example, if I'm asking students, or one of the things we'll have them do is um, at the end of every two-week session, they have to design a game and give us the presentation. And we probably will not design the game, build the game that they design, but when we hear them describing characters or characteristics or storylines or artwork, we get better intuition into the lives of our user and it makes us better developers. But more specifically, if we're going to ask about um, three different character sketches that we have for our pirates coming up, we will um, ask them about that and then we'll ask them, for example, to draw the pirates. And that's an, an important part of this multiple ways of getting feedback is these things all work together. I, I might use some blogging question, a video closet, focus group, some observations, interviews. And what's amazing about that is I might ask them a, a question in the focus group that I don't really get very good feedback on for whatever reason, but it's still in their brain and they're thinking about it. And then when they go into the video closet, it's prompted more thoughtful reflection or blogging in the video closet or the creative activity. We really use several of these at a time to get lots of different feedback because each user is going to have a better way, a preferred way to give us that feedback in there. So some examples of that, for example, is um, if to use the pirates example, if I have three different character sketches for to find out which ones they like, I might ask them to tell me about these characters in the video closet. I might post the pictures, the character sketches on the wall, and ask them to select a set of characters and tell us why they should be included in the next science pirates game. Or then I would give them some paper and pens and say, "Okay, now I want you to draw pirate captain kid and the first mate." And I tell you what, if you want to know what they like about your graphics or what they don't, ask them to draw their own because what they like about your graphics will be reflected in what they draw and what they don't like about graphics they will highlight to you that they didn't draw in theirs. All right. Another strategy is to train your testers. Now I mentioned we have them for two weeks. We go through a typology activity where they build the vocabulary. They learn about different types of games. We give them practice and help them articulate preferences by learning what challenge and what flow is. Now I know if you're doing testing, you may not want to go through this two-week process with our kids. And, and you don't have to. If you only have them for the short period of time, it can be as simple as just making sure you give them practice. If you have them for two hours, have them start off by critiquing some other game you don't care about. If you're doing a math game, have them play somebody else's math game or compare and contrast so that you kind of get them warmed up with different questions about those before the feedback you really care is on the docket. And also emphasize your role. We have always been delighted when we clarify. It's not so much I'm trying to figure out what you think, but I need you as an advisor because I want to make this game for a 14-year-old kid, and I'm not a 14-year-old kid, so help me understand what 14 year old kids are thinking and when you give them this role it takes it beyond a, a boring uh, focus group and it's more come on to our team and join us on this. Finally test, test, test. Well, I was joking a while back about another presentation that was test, 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 and my husband said, well, you can go one farther and say test, 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 and I said, no, that's just crazy. Test, 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 good. Test, 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 ridiculous. <laughs> Kidding aside, the reason for that is you have to know when you have enough information. It's easy when you're testing to get to the point. You're not necessarily trying to make this the perfect game for every person that comes in to your environment. You're just trying to remove the things that are barriers to them enjoying and learning it correctly. So they might want it to be red, I might want it to blue, be blue. The only reason that preference matters is if it significantly impacts their learning or their enjoyment. If it's not and it still works, that's enough. So at some point you have to learn what the preferences are 
when you're moving out of important usability stuff and just stop and move forward on that. Some other successful strategies that we found is we use developers as reviewers. I had this fantasy that would be able to do testing in our lab of other people's work and send them video closets and, and summaries. And we certainly can do that, but I'll tell you, for our testing, our developers are there. They're asking questions for a couple of reasons. One, that way it's really about learning about the problem and not just identifying a solution and then taking it to the team and asking it to be done. That's helpful because as our developers, our animators, our programmers are seeing the problems the kids are having, they might say, aha, here's a solution, work for it, discover that solution doesn't work. And because they were actively involved in that review, they can say, okay, what was really the problem we were fixing and how do we fix that? This has been crucial and we will always have our developers review. We use multiple reviewers, not only to aid in note taking, but because you need to understand the power that you have in the room asking questions. And you might be engaged with one kid and asking them a question, they're giving you feedback, and you might not realize there's another kid who's kind of opening their mouth to say something, that, or they decide not to, or they kind of roll their eyes at something someone says. And one of your team members might say, okay, let me interrupt you now. Um, now, Mark, when he was saying that, what did you think about that? Did you agree? And it makes for a much more casual environment. So for us, having one moderator, no one note taker, that hasn't worked. We usually have two, if not three, reviewers working on it at the same time. And then we test with kids, of course, but we also test with stakeholders and experienced developers. We'll bring teachers in if it's for classroom. We we'll use parents if it's for home use. We use other developers as part of our quality assurance committee when we're developing to help us look for things that could um, block for gatekeepers that could block this getting used or just things that we've avoided. We've really uh, come to appreciate that multiple feedback. It's a lot of work to get it, but it just makes our products significantly significantly better. So those are some of my thoughts. My email is bchamber at nmsu.edu. Please feel free to contact me if you'd like more information on our user testing. Thank you.